Okay, very good, wonderful. So welcome everybody. Our speaker today is Song Wang, a member here at the Institute uh, for Advanced Study, and she will talk about square function estimate for the calm in the three-dimensional space. Um, thank you very much for the opportunity to be able to speak here. Um, today I'm going to talk uh, about joint work with Larry Group and Lei Xiangzhang about a square function estimate for the calm in F3. Um, suppose that F is a function whose Fourier transform is supported on some manifold let's say in uh, Rn. This is M. And then we decompose the frequency space, this manifold M, into some pieces, theta. We call each piece each piece uh, piece theta. So um, and then we can we consider the partition of unity phi theta equals to one. And we define F theta as the free transform of F restricted on theta and then take the inverse Fourier transform. So the square function estimate means the following. Um, LP norm of F is bounded by the little l2 sum of f theta and then take um, and then take the lp norm so the square function asks me ask whether this kind of um, inequality is true so usually um, instead of letting f supported the fourier transform supported on m we can take um, very thin neighborhood, so one over R neighborhood. Um, R is a large number larger than one, is a large number bigger than one. And then, so square function, we can also ask what is the uh, smallest constant s depending on r such that for any f supported on one over our neighborhood uh, for your transform supported on one over our neighborhood of m we have this type of inequality And usually we consider um, p greater or equal to 2. Uh, one can see that when p equals to 2, uh, this is when p equal to 2, we can take as 2r to be a constant. So the question becomes, for what p? Can we have as p r 
bounded by R to the epsilon, where epsilon is any small number, uh, any small positive number. So this can be depending on a constant depending only on epsilon and then times R to the epsilon. So, so this is the, uh, the question we ask for the square function estimate. And square function estimate is closely related to another type of estimate called a decoupling estimate. So this is square function. Another type is called decoupling. Company estimate ask for the following. Well, we take the L P norm inside and then little L two norm outside. Uh, ask the same question for what p can we have uh, dpr bounded by r to the epsilon. And so in the recent years, there are, there are many studies about decoupling estimate, uh, starting from the work of uh, Pogan and Demeter. And so uh, I think we, we know well for some manifold, the, what the decoupling estimate should be. And one can see that once we have some square function estimate, we can just use Minkowski inequality to get uh, a decoupling estimate for the uh, correspond corresponding P. Uh, does that usually lose information? I mean, you could, if you're going from uh, square to decoupling, I mean, uh, I guess you'll explain what, what sharp bounds are. Do sharp bounds go to sharp bounds? Um, no. So uh, first of all, that's a very good question. The, the sharp bound depending on, uh, so the sharp bound means uh, the range of P depends on the curvature of M and also depend on the way we decompose beta. Mm -hmm. So in, in this talk, we are going to consider M to be the, the cone in R3. Um, I, I guess what my question was, are you, uh, you'll give some results for the square function. Will they recover the results for the decoupling? They do not require the, the sharp range of P. Oh, okay, okay. Also, the so-called sharp range is, uh, the, the sharp range for, for either square function estimate or decoupling are, you, are usually not the same. No, they're not the same. Okay, uh, we, we are going to discuss more protocol. Uh, what's the sharp range and how they imply each other. It was okay, so for M to be the cone, the truncated cone in R three.
it was conjectured by um, Markenhoff, Sieger, and Scott. Hmm. I guess we'll have to wait it to dry a little bit. Uh, So for the cone in R3, um, C between one and two. Then we decompose the cone into theta. Up with R to the minus a half. So remember the thickness is R to the minus one. It was conjectured by Mockenhoff, Sieger, and Sock that um, the, for the cone in R3, the S4 R is bounded by R to the epsilon. Um, so there, there are the, the four is the critical P for the cone in R3 uh, for many reasons. Um, for people who who does harmonic analysis, the four in R for the calling R three is the critical exponent for uh, the restriction uh, estimate. And also the way we choose R to the 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 width R to the minus a half is because at the width R to the minus a half, um, we can use our rectangular plank to cover the theta. So we, we are going to look at one example. Let f be sum over epsilon theta F theta. So um, epsilon theta takes plus or minus one um, randomly I D for each theta. Maybe it's better if I use capital F. Then the expectation of capital F, the L4 norm of capital F equals to the L4 norm of the square function. So this tells us that for any function f, we can take a random sign in front of f theta to, to uh, construct an, a, a random function capital F. And then for this random function, the square function estimate is sharp. Up to, up, uh, up to r to the epsilon. So for the calling in R3, 
to answer Peter's question, uh, the, the sharp range of P is um, P from two to four. And for P greater than four, we expect the square function estimate to be not true uh, for this R to the epsilon. And then for the coin R3, the decoupling estimate is P from two to six. And we have the decoupling constant is bounded by R to the epsilon. And this is uh, done by Hochberg and Demeter. Um, the, the square function estimate is, uh, is closely related to another conjecture called local smoothing conjecture. In fact, it was a con this co conjecture was raised when uh, Mokinkov, Siegel, and Sof studied the local smoothing uh, conjecture by Sof. So local smoothing conjecture says the following. So this was in 1992. So if you um, satisfy the wave equation. And then the with initial delta U naught and partial derivative U1. Then we have the LP norm of U in time space is bounded by a constant only depending on P and alpha U naught LP norm and this takes uh, the alpha derivative plus P alpha minus one. So this is for any P um, greater or equal to four and alpha greater than one half minus um, two over P. So the critical case is P equal to four and alpha greater than zero. So what, once we proved the critical case, we can also prove for other cases by um, interpolation. The history of uh, local smooth study, the local smoothing conjecture. Uh, I have a question. 
So the epsilon disappears in this? Uh, the epsilon goes to alpha greater than, than zero. Okay. Okay. So the interpolation takes. Sorry, uh, the alpha. I'm a bit confused. Uh, oh, P alpha. Okay, I see. It goes into alpha. The history. Uh, Mark and Hobbs figure this out and show that the square function um, conjecture implies local smoothing conjecture. And they also proved for P equals to four, alpha greater than one over eight. And then later by um, Tom Wolf in the year 2000, uh, he showed the full range of alpha for P greater than 74 and alpha is the expected number, the range, the expected range. Uh, he showed this by proving a sharp decoupling, by introducing the decoupling as the inequality. And also proved for sharp decoupling inequality for P greater than 74. When I say sharp means for the correct uh, power of R in the decoupling inequality, introduce idea of decoupling. And then For well, Gannon Demeter, they proved sharp decoupling. Which leads to um, local smoothing for P greater um, or equal to six and alpha greater than. Uh, one half minus two over p. There's some, uh, obviously in uh, Wolf's result, he's using p very large. Uh, it, what, what is that reflected in the geometry or his method, you know? Um, so the, the geometry of the decoupling inequality um, there, there is the decoupling constant, uh, DPR, and then for P uh, equals to infinity, we conjecture DPR to be R to some power, and that's, that's, that can be proved just using uh, triangle inequality, class holder. And so it's harder to show for smaller P. But that's what he did. Okay. Uh, and he also, uh, when you said geometry, and um, I think he also introduced some idea of instance estimate in this paper yeah, yeah. to prove decoupling. And we, uh, with Larry and Ray Xiang, we, we proved these two conjectures also uses some instance from. Uh, yeah, so I was just, uh, uh, maybe when you get to that, or if you, uh, it's just, an, uh, I mean, the 74 is obviously not an important number. It's just somehow he's perturbing away from infinity with some, I was wondering if there's some explanation of what he's doing crudely that uh, you guys are doing better or maybe Bergen and Demeter. But if there's no uh, uh, simple answer, don't worry about it. Okay. Um, there, there are also many other uh, works in, in between, but um, to, to 
So this list is certainly not complete. So um, here we can we so we, we started thinking about this problem by um, trying to figure out uh, what steps that are in, in the decoupling estimate. So why we cannot we, why we only prove for p greater or equal to six and by studying examples that this method cannot prove for p equals to four. Uh, maybe just uh, one word about, uh, so recent years after the work of Bofan and Demeter, there, we, there are many improvements on uh, decoupling theory. Uh, one, one reason why decoupling inequality is, um, is relatively easy to prove is that the, the formula, the decoupling inequality itself is, is convenient to induct, but the, the square function uh, inequality is not easy to induct. So one, one cannot just use uh, induction of scale for the square function estimate. So, um, uh, yeah, I had a question, uh, Hong. Um, so uh, two things, to what extent are the same theorems true for non Schrodinger, Schrodinger, Schrodinger equation. Ah, for uh, you mean the do you, you mean the local smoothing or the uh, yeah, local smoothing? Yes. The, the local smoothing for Schrodinger. Um, I think is that a much easier question, or I mean, how, how do they compare? Um, the local smoothing for Schrodinger, I think, is um, equivalent to. Uh, the restriction conjecture in Schrodinger, but uh, the, the local smoothing for the quantum is not equivalent uh, to a restriction um, conjecture for the quantum. I see. For example, the, the restriction for quantum in R3 was proved a long time ago. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so but I have one other qu very naive question. I don't understand why this is called uh, smoothing. Um, can you just say a word about that? Um, I think it is. Um, so uh, I think this is about the alpha. So alpha means the number of derivatives when p equals to three perhaps smaller than expected number of derivatives. I see. Okay. Okay. So we now we are going to um, slowly introducing the 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 estimate we prove. Um, A key, we, we proved the sharp square function estimate by um, proving an even stronger inequality that's easier to induct. So a key step of our proof is to find the, the statement to induct. And we are going to, um, to introduce the notations um, for, the, for this statement. So First of all, we recall the uncertainty principle.
if a function f has Fourier transform supported on some um, on some symmetric convex and also compact. The center CE, then uncertainty principle tells us that um, F is essentially a constant on the dual of E which is defined as also on translates So it says that if a function whose Fourier transform is supported on some uh, compact, uh, symmetric convex set, then um, the, the absolute value of f, more speaking, cannot uh, vary too much in its field. Um, for example, before we consider the F beta. So now theta is a small plank of width r to the minus a half and thickness r to the minus one and then length about one. So now F by this uncertainty principle F theta is essentially a constant on translated copies of T theta, of theta star. So this T parallel to theta star means that uh, T is a translated copy of theta star. Now let's draw what theta star is. So for this theta, the theta star is a plank of width r to the one half, because this width is r to the minus a half, and then of length r in the direction of this thickness and then of thickness one in this direction. So F theta restricted on T is also called a wave packet. And then the, the curvature of the call is you know, once they're recorded, we might possibly put them online so that people can watch them afterwards or something, but we would have to try and have Go ahead. Go ahead. I think it was a mistake. Okay. And So the, the curvature of the call in, in that matters a lot in this study is represented as the direction of those t those is uh, are different for different theta. So if say for this theta prime theta prime 
time stuff. And then once the directions are different, we can see that the, the planks have different directions, so they intersect in a small um, in in a small domain. So a lot of the uh, study was um, contributed to uh, how those soil packets intersect or interact. And now to study F, we need to find a way to organize those wave packets. First, we, we can decompose the cone into coarser um, decomposition. Let's say tau is another plan of with, we say, let D tau be the width, another plank of width S, and then thickness S as well. Um, S is any number between R to the minus a half and one. Then we are going to find a box to contain those planks in nearby directions. So we define u tau r as r s squared times tau star. So this means that we dilate tau star by a factor of r s squared. So let's see what u tau r is. So u tau r is a box of thickness r s well, and then of width r times s of length r. So we organize our wave packets into the ones inside each box. And then in particular, if beta is contained in tau, then beta star is contained in, in u tau r. So now we define for each Um, 
U that's translated copy of U tau R. We define F U equals to F tau restricted on U. So finally, we are ready to um, introduce the statement with proof. So now, So let s smaller so smaller r is any number smaller than capital R. Then the the inductive statement we are going to prove is that for any small r between one and capital R, we have this inequality and in the end, we are going to show that this is bounded by um, Archer epsilon. So th this is a complicated statement uh, in inequality. And one crucial object is F u. So the left hand side, sum over b small r is we sum over a finitely overlapping uh, covering of the whole space by uh, balls of really small r. And here, um, f br, so one can view br as another u with with u tau r as b tau is about one and r equals to small r. So in other words, f b r is just f restricted on b r, but we can view it as f u for, um, for this definition of u tau r. And then this, when we sum over s between r to the minus a half and one, it means that we sum over all the dyadic numbers s between r to the minus half and one. And here we sum over a covering of our comb by coarser decomposition tau of with s. Here we sum over um, a finitely overlapping covering of the whole space by translate copies of u tau r for fixed tau and, and the capital R. And here, one feature is that this L2 norm, this is L2 norm instead of L4 norm. So usually when we, we prefer estimate with of L2 norm because L2 norm is easier to induct. 
And here, in fact, it is um, an approximation of the L4 norm, as we are going to see next. Maybe I will pause and see if there are uh, any questions about this inequality. So, so what are you inducting on again? What's the, what, what parameters are you inducting on? Um, we are going to induct on the two parameters, little r and capital R. So when, when we do the proof, they will start from something close to one and, and grow gradually to our um, capital R. Okay. Mm -hmm. what, and what's the induction hypothesis on capital S? We are going to see next. So um, the theorem we proved is as As small r, capital R, is bounded by capital R divided by small r. To the epsilon. So this is um, this is the estimate we proof, and the induction hypothesis is for smaller r or for smaller both are smaller. This holds true. So first, we are going to see how this uh, theorem implies square function estimate. And when the we are going to use a special case of the theorem that's as one r bounded by r to the epsilon. When, when the left-hand side, smaller r is 1, the left-hand side is roughly the L4 norm of f to the fourth power. The reason is that since f is supported on a truncated cone, a neighborhood of a truncated cone, then f is essentially a constant in a ball of radius one. So the left-hand side is essentially uh, L4 norm of F to the fourth power. And then the right-hand side, we are going to see how this will, um, uh, will be bounded by the square function as, um, on the right-hand side. So the right-hand side, for each u to the minus one f u, we have is bounded by the 
sum over f beta. Beta is like tau for this u, a translate copy of u tau r. And integrate on u square. And then we just use Holder's inequality to get the alpha norm of a square function. And then when we sum over everything here, we are, it's, it's not hard to show that that's bounded by the square function. So, so now we have shown that um, the, the, this inequality implies the square function estimate. And we are going to use three lemmas to prove this inequality. Lemma one um, explains that how this inequality index. So lemma one says that for any s2 greater than s1 smaller than uh, r1 smaller than r2 smaller than r3, we have SR1, SR3 is bounded by SR1, SR2 times maximum of all S between R2 to the minus a half and one S, S squared, R2, S squared, R3. So note that the, this S is smaller than one, so each of those parameters is a smaller number compared to half. Um, and also the ratio is, in particular, the ratio on the, on the number is smaller compared to S, uh, compared to R1 and R3. And this is proved by uh, uses Lorentz free scaling which says that um, for each fixed tau we can rescale this term to be something that looks like the left hand side And then lemma two says that SR R square is bounded by a constant. So this is the lemma that's that we call instance estimate. Uh, we are going to see in the end how like how it is an instance estimate. Now to to start the to get to start the um, the proof, we will need a lemma three, which is essentially the estimate for a uh, the parabola, which is one dimensional Laura, and we know a lot about parabola. So we can we can consider the tilted cone. So 
Sorry. So this column is defined by x, x squared equals to y and z. It's just we move this column, this, um, we tilt it by 45 degrees. And then we consider the gamma one over K defined as um, Y between one and one plus one over K. And then uh, Z smaller than one. So this is, and K is, roughly r to the epsilon. So k is a, a sufficiently small number compared to r, but also sufficiently large compared to one. And now, gamma one over k can be an approximation of the, the previous truncated cone, but it has a property that lies in one over k neighborhood of a parabola. So lemma three says we can define the same thing as k smaller r capital R if f is supported on one over r neighborhood of gamma one over k. So lemma three says that as k r k is bounded by k to the epsilon over 10. So this L, this lemma three is um, even though this statement was not uh, used previously, but the, the, the method to prove it is well known. So we use this Cordova. And using these three lemmas, it's, um, it's not hard to show that we can, sh we can conclude the proof. So maybe ju just one last word about how lemma two is an instance estimate. So the left hand side can be bounded by The left hand side can be bounded by f theta square and sum and then square. So re remember that at the beginning, um, we say f theta is essentially a constant on translated copies of theta star. So f theta can be same as a weighted sum of the characteristic function of P. So now this is a, a weighted sum of characteristic functions of those planks. And this thing to estimate that is essentially to estimate how those planks intersect. And that's an instance estimate. We prove it by taking the Fourier transform by Prontrell.
and study the Fourier transform of this function and decomposes the frequency space um, appropriately. I think I will stop here. Thanks for your attention. Thank you. Are there any questions? I, I didn't quite understand this incidence uh, estimate. So th th this is usually some kind of a combinatorial uh, uh, geometric uh, estimate, right? Uh, one can understand it as a combinatorial geometric estimate, but the, the way we prove it is and then decompose. Okay. It's really analytic. Thank you. I have maybe a, a naive question. So is there a uh, more refined conjecture on what the, f on, 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 on what the, so you, you show that um, the constant is smaller than any power, right? Yes. Is there maybe a more refined conjecture on what, uh, what the type of function it should be of R? No, no, no. At the at the very, you know, in the, in the, in the in the in the very in the very first theorem. Um, right. Okay. So this is this is what you say. It's for every epsilon, right? Or am I wrong? Or am I missing something? Uh, I cannot. I mean, we cannot hear you. Actually, I think you're too far from the from the microphone. So uh, it's for any small epsilon. So the epsilon goes to zero. Right. So could you could you could you think it's like I don't know some kind of logarithm actually in fact, uh, or you know? I'm, I'm not sure if we can prove that. Uh, I I don't know. Okay. So there's there's no there's no feeling or no idea what actually the function should be. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Good. Uh, are there other questions? Okay. That doesn't seem to be the case. So thank you very much.